welcome to Stuff You Should Know from HowStuffWorks.com. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and there's Jerry over there. And this is Stuff You Should Know, Unsolved Mysteries Edition. How do you pronounce this? Diet love? Diet love? Diet love? Yeah, that's how I've always pronounced it. That's what we're going with, okay? Diet yeah, love. For some reason, I always just. Diet love. I always. Oh, that's a good one. A, I like that one. A bit of a Russian. Diet love. Twang. Just say. Diet <laughs> yeah, love. Anyway, Diet love is the name of a fa- very famous pass. Yeah. In the Ural Mountains. And it was named after, it turns out, a 23 year old mountaineer, expert outdoors person uh, named um, uh, Igor Dyatlov. I always want to call him Yuri because there's like five Yuris in his group, but he was the only Igor. Yeah, and I did not know that this pass was named for him. And when I first started researching this, I was like, that's a coincidence. That's a coincidence. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shall we tell the story? Yeah, let's. Um, people might uh, have you. You'd heard of this before, right? Yeah, and I believe we may have touched on this in a top ten once. Maybe, but a, or a video that we did. But it, whatever it was, it was a little tiny short thing. I mean, we mentioned the um, Gary Mathias disappearance was called the American Diat Love event or yeah. disappearance. Um, this is this is totally different in a lot of ways. In yeah. most ways. But you can f- kind of find some similarities here or there. But, yeah, let's tell the story, man. All right. So we're talking about a group of students in 1959, mm-hmm. early February, mm-hmm. uh, from Ural, uh, U-R-A-L State Technical University. Yeah. Go uh, what? what go uh, <laughs> <Mascot B. laughs> fighting uh, Ruskies. Yeah. The hammers and sickles. <laughs> that sounds good. Okay. The hammers and sickles. Uh, they were all very um, well acquainted with camping mm-hmm. and backcountry hiking and skiing, yeah. cross-country skiing. So they weren't a bunch of rookies out there. No, no, and that's really important. Like these, yeah. these people were very well experienced with this kind of stuff. Yeah, they knew what they were doing. And there was a group of, uh, how many were there? Seven? There were ten total. Oh, ten total, nine of whom actually went into the woods. The mm-hmm. only person to make it out of this trip alive was the one person who stayed back because he wasn't feeling well, nope. stayed behind at the village. Uh, that was another Yuri, Yuri Udin. Mm-hmm. Um, why, why? Yeah, got a little sick and was bummed, and little did he know that would have been uh, almost certainly a life-saving moment for him. Yeah, he had uh, rheumatism. He came down with a bout of rheumatism and actually stayed back in this little tiny village where they uh, they set off from. And to say that they were, like, in the middle of nowhere is an understatement. Like, yeah. they were in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, not a lot going on there. Um, and I think, like, a two-plus-week two, two plus week trip. And they were trying to get to Mount Ortaten, right? Yeah, O-R-T-O-T-E-N? Ortaten? Or- Ortaten. Sure. Ortaten. Ortaten. They were trying to make it to this mountain, which is a part of the Ural Mountains. Um, and to get there, they— Basically, cross country skied. They climbed this. They climbed mountains to get to this mountain. Mm-hmm. They had to camp out in this, this is like negative thirty degree weather. Um, just crazy nuts, middle of nowhere, and yeah. they were having the time of their lives. These students were. Yeah, there. I mean, there there is footage uh, or footage by way of photographs uh, because they took a lot of pictures. Mm-hmm. And if you go through and look at the. Um, the early parts of this trip, they did look like they were having a lot of fun. They were. They were good pals. Mm-hmm. They did a very adorable thing. Uh, on the way, they they started making their own little newspaper mm-hmm. about the trip. The evening order ten. <laughs> yeah, where they would just – it was essentially a little fun diary, like group diary they mm-hmm. did. Right. But they put it in the form of a, of a daily newspaper uh, of their journey, which is very, very cute and sad. Yeah. And uh, one of the w- one of the ways I saw their group described was that there were there were two girls in this group and the rest were guys, um, but that there wasn't any like real sexual tension or rivalries going on. Yeah, but there was like kind of crushes here or there, and like it like uh, like 
humorous flirtation, that kind of thing. Just right. keeping everything real light. Yeah, but it wasn't like Yuri betrayed me. Right, nothing when he like hooked that. Hooked up with, uh, well, she wasn't named Yuri. Hooked up with Zena. <laughs> <laughs> was one of them Zena? Yeah. There was Zena and then uh, Lud, uh, Lud, Ludmia. Jerry's Ludmia. just laughing. You try it, Jerry. <laughs> you can't even talk. You know, she minored in Russian studies. <laughs> oh, I had no idea. <laughs> Did I ever tell you about the time uh, you, me, and I went to visit friends in London? Okay. And we were on our way to to go to Moscow for the were first time. Were these the the guys that I met in London? Yes. Yeah. Who now live in L.A., Michael and Adam. Oh, they're wonderful. They live in L.A. now. Welcome to America, dudes. <laughs> um, but we went to visit them in London and found out that um, – because Adam, uh, I think, majored in Russian studies mm-hmm. uh, or Russian literature, I think. He's like, you you have your visa? And we're like, what do you mean? <laughs> He's like, you have to have a visa to go to Russia. And we're like, I don't think so. No one said anything to us about that. <laughs> and he's like, no, you definitely do. We called the airline. They're like, yeah, you don't have a visa? And we're like, how did you not? You mean like a visa card? <laughs> uh, right. That's what we thought you meant. And um, we didn't go to Russia. I think I remember. We ended up going to Majorca instead last minute. Oh, well, what a drag. Which, right. <laughs> We're like, this could have been way worse than it turned out. I think I remember you having plans to go to Russia, and mm-hmm. I never heard anything. That's why we didn't go. I think I remember at some point in my life being like, that's weird. Josh well, never talked about Russia again. We, but you heard me talk about Majorca. Yeah. Right. So it all adds up now. That's That was all that trip. Interesting. Yeah. So all that's right. my Russia story. That's as close as I've come. <laughs> that's funny because you guys are pretty buttoned up. I know That's we were both like really surprised at ourselves. Out of but, you guys, yeah. All right, thanks for that, Chuck. I appreciate that. About you being buttoned up, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's like that sounds like something I would do. <laughs> like you need a visa. <laughs> I don't know. That's pretty basic level stuff. I think most yeah. people would catch that. All right. So where are they? They're on the mountain of the dead, which I don't believe we mentioned was the uh, was the translation that the local indigenous tribe, the Mansi tribe, called this mountain Kolatsyakl. The Mountain of the Dead. And the Monsi tribe um, will will pop up later in theories. Mm-hmm. So just we're putting pins in things. Do you remember <laughs> in our Magic Mushroom episode where we talked about like um, reindeer herder who would feed their reindeer mushrooms and then drink the pee to trip themselves? I think I do remember that. That's the Monsi. Oh. They're like Siberian um, nomads, I believe. Wow. And who, it, who know how to party. Yeah, and uh, like the the magic mushrooms that their sham- their shamans eat, and probably their their regular people eat too. Uh-huh. They're very toxic, um, and one way to get rid of the toxins is to feed them to reindeer, and the oh. reindeer f- the reindeer's yeah, kidneys filter that. out the toxins, and you drink the reindeer pee, and the psychoactive stuff is still present in their pee. Wow. Yeah, and they think that possibly. I'm saving this for the Christmas episode. Okay. <laughs> okay. So go ahead. I'm sorry. But that's the Monty people. Yeah, that's the Monty people. So um, what they end up doing is they decide on the night of uh, February 2nd to camp in, in a decidedly sort of odd place. It wasn't so weird, mm-hmm. but they were only about a mile from the tree line where they would have had much better cover um, and it would have been slightly warmer. And it's just it makes more sense to camp in the in the forest right. than out on this open ridge. Right. But nevertheless, for some reason, they decided to camp there. They think possibly because they didn't want to backtrack because they would have had to backtrack some to get back to the tree line. Yeah, they would have had to go a mile back down the slope, which means that they would have had to go cover that mile up again. And that's what uh, Yuri, uh, what's the the guy who was his last name? Yuri Yudin? Yeah. He, that's what he later said in an interview that he he thought it was either that, that uh, um, Dyatlov didn't want to backtrack because mm-hmm. Dyatlov was the leader, remember? Sure. Um, or he wanted to practice camping on an exposed mountain slope, Yeah. which from what I, I've heard about this guy, it sounds like something he might do. He might be like, hey, gang, I've got a great idea. Yeah, we've never done this. Right. Let's try it. And they, they would have been able to quite easily. Um, they, pitched the, they pitched the camp, but in between pitching camp and this is February 2nd, 1959, mm-hmm. in between pitching camp and making dinner, something happened. They never got to make dinner, and whatever happened to them happened in between that time on February 2nd, 1959. We'll be back right after this. All 
right. That was quite a teaser, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> you can talk regular now. Okay. So uh, the search party didn't go out right away because Dyatlov had said before, um, hey, we're going to be back around February 12th mm -hmm. or maybe a bit longer if we are so inspired to stay out there a bit longer. Which is, or yeah, if it's going slower than we thought, right? Which is not the, I mean, nowadays people would be a little more uh, mm -hmm. buttoned up like you guys, and say, <laughs> and a little more specific maybe uh, when you're hiking in a place like this. But nevertheless, or have like a satellite phone with you or something. But <laughs> yeah. I, again, so these these kids are in the middle of nowhere, totally cut off from contact. It was, we're going in in January. Yeah. You'll hear from us probably around February 12th or so. Yeah, but because he put a, a wishy-washy timeline on it, um, it didn't – it wasn't until the 20th that anyone had any suspicions that uh, anything was wrong. Mm -hmm. And then not until the 26th that volunteer searchers finally found this camp. Yeah. So it was much, much later. So they found the camp, and right out of the gate, they're like, this is a little weird. Yeah. The tents seem to have been cut from the inside out. That's a very weird thing. Not only that, their boots are here, um, their clothes are here, their gear is here, their skis, like everything they would need. It was all just abandoned at this camp. Yeah. It looked like they left in a hurry. Um, and then even even stranger, from what from the official report, and we'll see that that was like, this has gone on for so long and been open to so much interpretation yeah. that um, there's a lot of taint to this legend. A lot of taint. Um, that the, but the official report said that there were maybe eight or nine tracks, yeah. eight, the tracks of eight or nine people around these tents. So that would account for everybody in the party mm -hmm. without the addition of other people being on scene. Yeah, and the way they left, like you said, mm -hmm. like, it was almost as if they they went and got in their tents, zipped them up, and found um, a dozen pit vipers in each one mm -hmm. because they they cut out of the tent and ran away in their underwear, basically. Right. Not all of them in their underwear, but, you know, barefoot yeah. and with very little clothing, like as if something inside the tent had, you know, was about to kill them. Okay. That's a big, big thing. It's a weird way to leave your camp. So these these guys are missing, um, and they this search party that found the tent in pretty short order. I'm not exactly sure how long it took, but from what I understand, it was the same search. They found the first two bodies, and they found these first two bodies. It was um, the two Yuris, Yuri uh, Krivonyashenko and Yuri Doroshenko. Um, not the, the third year that stayed back. No. Because there were literally three Yuris, right? Yep. Three out of ten. Right. Um, that's 30% of them were mm -hmm. Yuris. Were Yuris. <laughs> so um, Yuri Krivonoshenko, I just said it again because I wanted to do better than the first time. Uh -huh. And then Yuri Doroshenko, they were found, both of them wearing their underwear. I think they were both barefoot. Um, at the tree line. At the tree line. They call it the big tree. It was a large cypress tree. Mm -hmm. um, so they were in their underwear barefoot dead a mile down the mountain from the camp. Yeah, which is where they said that they probably should have camped mm -hmm. uh, for more cover. So very interestingly, supposedly both of their hands were burned, I saw. Yeah, I saw that they were just beaten up and that there was human flesh found in the bark of the tree. I didn't see that at all. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so as this if is, they had tried to climb it in desperation. Okay, I did see that that there were like broken branches that indicated climbing. I didn't see there was flesh in the bark. Flesh in the bark. Okay, um, so maybe burned hands means like they were raw from climbing the tree. I don't know, um, but there was signs of a fire. Yeah, there was like a, a campfire that they had built, and there were unburnt branches kind of collected by it too, right? But yes. they were both dead, and they were the first two discovered, the two Yuris. That's Very right. weird, but nothing that couldn't be accounted for by hypothermia. Yeah, it was being out there in your underwear to begin with that was the weird part. Again, in like negative 30 degree weather. Yeah. Negative 30 with howling winds. So, ooh, foreshadowing. Okay. Uh, three more bodies, uh, including our leader, Mr. Dietloff, uh, they were found between those two points, between the original camp and that tree. 
and it looked as if they were headed back toward camp. Yeah, the like, way they were laid out. Like imagine somebody like kind of dying as they're crawling up a slope back toward camp. Right. Makes sense to me. So let's say that they all kind of went to this tree and then they started to head out back to camp mm -hmm. to maybe get their gear because they realized we're in a bad spot. We're, all our gear is up there and we're down here in our underwear and barefoot. And why are we? Yeah. <laughs> Again. Who knows? Yeah. So they found um, Igor Dyatlov, um, Zaneda Kol Kolmogorva. Okay. Why am I the only one saying their names? <laughs> I'll say the last one, uh, Rustam Slobodin. Well, I, even Jerry could have said that one. <laughs> so Rustam had a uh, about a two and a half inch gash in his head uh, and a fractured skull. That was very weird. It is weird, but the doctor said that's not what this person died from. Uh, again, all five of these people died from hypothermia, even though this guy has been smashed in the head somehow. Yeah. So um, the, the investigators are like, okay, so far it's weird, but something happened and then all these people died of hypothermia. Okay? Yeah. That didn't hold up when they finally found the other three bodies. Of, yeah, two uh, months later, four two, bodies. Yeah, in May, I think after some of the snow melt, they found four, they found four more bodies in a gully down um, down slope from the tree. Mm -hmm. So there's the tree where the first two bodies were found. Up slope, there were the next three bodies, like they were crawling toward back toward camp. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, down slope of the tree, the last four bodies were found. Yeah, these. Th this is where it gets very strange. Very strange. These bodies, they were. They didn't die from hypothermia. They died of some very weird uh, internal injuries. Some of them um, had their skulls crushed. Two of them had um, massive chest fractures and broken ribs. Um, one of them was missing her. Uh, wh wh which one was it? Uh, Ludmia uh, Dubnina. She was missing her tongue. And part of her mouth and face. Yeah, they were. Uh, she was also missing her eyes, as was one of the other people. Um, and you know, this could have been explained away as maybe an animal ate this stuff, but there was no outside trauma. No, when you looked at these people, it wasn't like you have been clearly hit very hard on the head with a stick right. or a baseball bat, or you have had your eyeballs pecked out by a vulture. Mm -hmm. uh, no outward signs. They didn't find out until later on that all these internal injuries had occurred. Yeah, one That's of the— That's really strange. It was very strange. One of the doctors who examined the bodies in the official report said that this was like— um, th it was totally out of the capability of any human to inflict these injuries. It was more like the injuries you would see from a car crash. Yeah. And so they would have, like, crushed bones, crushed skulls, but they um they would not they they didn't have any like soft tissue damage right like it wasn't like a somebody like hit them with an axe but you know they had the injuries sustained like they were hit by an axe but not the outward out like external injuries like they were crushed by an axe or something yeah although a lot of them were missing soft tissue mm -hmm. which uh but no outward signs of that that's i just can't figure that one out no so we'll 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 put a pin in that missing soft tissue stuff, okay? <laughs> okay. So there was something else that was really peculiar that has never been explained, but at least two of the bodies were found um, to be, like the clothing they were wearing was radioactive. Yeah, and we should point out too that some of this clothing they were wearing came off of the other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe some shoes and uh, one of the women had parts of a uh, wool pants wrapped around her. Mm -hmm. So they had scavenged some of the clothes from their dead, I guess, or dying compatriots mm -hmm. uh, is the only thing people can figure out, and it contained radiation. Yeah. But the, that was the only thing that contained radiation. The Right. The, 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 the fact that they were, like, taking clothes from one another, that makes sense. And you can even say that the, the people who weren't wearing clothes, you can chalk that up to um, – something called paradoxical undressing. Yeah, this is odd. Which is like found in, I think, something like a quarter of all hypothermia cases. Mm -hmm. that You'll find the person like uh, like stripped 
because something in your hypothalamus goes haywire. Yeah. And you feel like your body temperature is actually rising, like you're getting hot yeah. when actually it's going down. Yeah. It's a weird quirk of hypothermia sometimes. So you can even say like maybe these people actually shed their clothes purposefully. And then, of course, people who weren't undergoing paradoxical undressing were taking the clothes and putting it on themselves. Mm -hmm. Totally makes sense. Where did the radiation come from? Why just the clothing? That is beyond bizarre, and it's never been explained to any anyone's satisfaction. Yeah, and one more strange-ish thing, um, not completely off the charts, but like I said, they found the, the, the camera film. Uh, that's why we have all these pictures. Uh, and the infamous 33rd frame mm -hmm. was the last shot on this roll, which showed uh, sort of a series of white lights or a big white light against black. Could have been nothing, mm -hmm. some weird exposure. Who right. knows? Yeah. But they had the camera set up on like a homemade tripod with the lens cap off, like facing out as if it were like, hey, let's have this camera ready to take a picture of something that mm -hmm. we're seeing out there. Right. Uh, and then uh, I believe in the weeks previous to this, other hikers had reported seeing um, like glowing orbs and glowing lights and things like this. Uh, was it the weeks previous or the weeks after? I thought it was previous. I think it was after, or that there was another group that was— Well, this has similar sightings at that time, so okay, who knows? There was another group that was between 30 and 50 miles away, basically doing the same thing, Yeah, um, that reported seeing lights around the same time. So who knows? But the, the, the fact—and like you said, it's not off the charts, but the fact that um, I think it was Rustam who had the camera yeah. but didn't have any of his gear or outer outerwear— but he grabbed his camera. That is pretty bizarre. Yeah. Uh, there was an investigator named Lev Ivanov. He was the lead guy. Mm -hmm. And um, he was really into this case, obviously, for a while. He brought a Geiger counter along mm -hmm. that apparently just kind of spiked when he was ever around yeah, the camp. Yeah, he was the one who discovered that there was radioactivity at all. Um, but they officially closed the case like a month later or something. And they said it. Uh, they listed the cause of, of death as a compelling natural force that they could not overcome. Yeah, that's a really vague, creepy statement. Yeah. So that was that was another thing that really raised everyone's suspicions was that the investigators came in within three weeks of I think finding the last bodies, who again had not died from hypothermia, but had died from really bizarre, massive internal trauma. Yeah. They closed the case on it, put it under lock and key, um, filed it away as classified, and kept anyone from the area for the next three years. Just yeah. closed off the area for three years. And it wasn't until like the early 90s that these files were opened again. And so the fact that, that they had been, you know, classified actually in Soviet Russia was not that bizarre. Yeah. They just classified everything. But it was strange that when they declassified these things after the, the the Soviet Union dissolved, that there were like big chunks of these files just totally missing. So who knows? Maybe they got misplaced over time. But when you add up all this stuff, the official investigation being hurried and then classified and then parts missing later on, mm -hmm. um, that, that is a little weird. It does suggest to a lot of people that the, the Soviet government either knew something, yeah. found something, or had some sort of role in this that they they didn't want everyone to know about. Should we take another break? Yeah. All right, we're going to come back and talk about some of the leading theories and debunk some of them right after this. Did we mention that two groups of people reported flying objects or just the one? I, I only knew about one. Yeah, there were two groups of people, uh, one that were camping nearby about 30 miles away, and then um, other reports in that month had mm -hmm. been reported, uh, orange balls of fire. And here's one direct quote. Goodness gracious, orange um, <laughs> balls of fire. <laughs> this is in, from the written testimony. Uh, one person said he saw a shining circular body fly over the village 
from southwest to northeast. The shining disk was practically the size of a full moon, a blue-white light surrounded by a blue halo. The halo uh, brightly flashed like the flashes of distant lightning, and when the body disappeared behind the horizon, the sky lit up in that place for a few more minutes. So that that's actually, I mean, not out of the realm of possibility that that person really did see that because people have put um, have suggested that these were missile tests that were they were seeing. Yeah. So should we go with that as theory number one? Yeah. The thing is, is though um, the guy, the lead investigator, Lev Levinoff, was that his name? Yeah, Lev Ivanoff. He said, "I suspect that this is in a, um, a interview he gave." Um, I suspected at the time and am almost sure now that these bright flying spheres had a direct connection to the group's death. He didn't go into any more detail about that, and he he himself has died of old age now, I believe. Yeah. Um, but there there are a lot of people who say these weird sightings in the sky had something to do with it. Either they irradiated the group. Um, one of the things, there was a 12-year-old boy from their town of Ekaterinburg, yeah. which was known at the time as um, uh, Svedlovsk, um, that that he reported that some of them were kind of orange tanned, like weirdly tanned, yeah. um, and that their hair was gray. Uh, so a lot of people have said irradiated. They were irradiated by UFOs mm-hmm. or missile tests or something like that. Um, you can actually kind of explain the the weird tanning and I've seen a picture of one of them at the morgue um, as they were mummified. There was probably one of yeah. the members of the group who wasn't found until May, and they were partially mummified by the by the exposure to the snow for, you know, weeks or months. Yeah. That was probably explained that. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, they were on the pathway, apparently, for uh, what's called the R-7 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Launches. Mm-hmm. But... Um, it just doesn't hold water with the radiation only being in their clothes. Yeah, that's very weird. That's like the one thing that doesn't quite add up. Yeah, another explanation for them becoming irradiated is that, yes, they were near a nuclear missing missile testing site and that they drank um, melted snow. Yeah. But again, why would just their clothes, why wouldn't they have become irradiated? I don't know. Or any of their gear or the tent or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, what else we got? Another one, and this is the... Most people who claim to be sensible say this is the explanation. Occam's razor? That it was, sure, that it was an a- avalanche, mm-hmm. that an avalanche came down the slope because they were, you know, camping out on a mountain ridge, yeah. face of a mountain, um, and that an avalanche came and they knew it was coming, so they cut open their tent and fled into the night and then got caught by hypothermia and died. Makes sense. I mean, that would get most people, especially an experienced group of mountaineers, out of their tents pretty quick. By cutting through it? Cutting through it, maybe. The thing is, is it doesn't explain why some of them, but not all of them, had massive trauma. Mm -hmm. And again, it certainly doesn't explain the radiation at all. Or the missing tongue. Yes, that was another one. Which was never found, by the way. No. So the missing tongue I've seen... It's, I saw that it was removed while the the, the girl was alive. Ugh. I'm sorry, her name was uh, Ludmia. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I saw that, but then I also saw that it's, she had been found near a creek, and that it's possible that it had just like like m- basically melted away from the water, the action of the water. Hmm. Here's the problem. This was 1959. Mm-hmm. The the official report was kept under seals for decades, and conjecture was added. You don't know at this point who yeah. who to believe. There's so many sites out there dedicated. Yeah, to this. and there's a 12 year old reporting from the funeral. Like that's <laughs> that's the only like documentation we have of, yeah. their, of what they look like. His name actually is. Um, Yuri uh, Kuncevich. Another Yuri. Another Yuri. And he was he was that, that 12-year-old child. He became kind of obsessed with it, and he set up the Dyatlov um, Museum and the Dyatlov Foundation. And uh, basically he just keeps the whole thing alive and is trying to get the government to that reopen kid. the case. That kid, yeah. Wow. So he really, really stuck to it. He's really taking advantage. Yeah. <laughs> what else you got for theories? Well, you know, that tribe, the Monsi tribesmen, there is a theory that they attacked them. Um, but nothing about that holds water. They didn't have any footsteps mm-hmm. uh, in the snow. 
There were or footprints. There were um, peaceful people by all accounts. Had never done anything like that. There was no reason to do anything like that. So just go ahead and discount that one. Yeah, I would say doesn't make any sense. Uh, animals um, attack, kind of the same thing. Same, th- yeah. Didn't they find tracks. any tracks. Yeah. The other thing that that the other reason the avalanche theory doesn't necessarily hold up is there wasn't necessarily any evidence of an avalanche having covered up the thing. Well, in a tent, yeah, it would have. Swept that tin away and all the gear probably, right? Sure. Or covered it up. Yeah. What else? Uh, high winds. There's one theory that maybe one of the members, maybe one of the Yuris went out to PP mm-hmm. and a wind swept him away and everyone else like ran out to look for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, this article you found where they're kind of debunking some of this stuff said, you know, that it doesn't make much sense that all these experienced people would have behaved this way. And just ran out in their underwear, and, right? You know, it would have been a little more of a organized, sensible effort. Yeah, if that had happened. Yeah, you really can't can't um, overstate that the the level of experience and the combined, um, like the group that they formed. Yeah, was like greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah. So yeah, they they wouldn't have it wouldn't have been amateur like that. The one that and this is the kind of the new fringy semi-scientific explanation that I find just fascinating <laughs> is the infrasound one. Yeah. I mean, we talked about infrasound in one of our episodes. I don't remember which one. Can't remember which one, but um, this is, uh, it's a phenomenon where wind, and in this area they said that this definitely could have happened, mm. where wind collides with the the mountain and the trees and everything and produces this low frequency range sound that has been known to inspire panic and dread, confusion, fear, all the things that would kind of add up in this case. Right. So there's like this really weird, um, it's very tough to figure out whether that's actually real. Yeah. Like if you look at the science, the scientific literature behind it, there's some, but more often than not, it's just some somebody claiming on their website that this is real. Right. This, the literature is not necessarily there, but that's not to say that it's just totally made up. Yeah. It's like the the it, the um, studies of this stuff hasn't caught up to the some of the claims on the internet. Yeah. But supposedly there is from wind vortices that could have produced it on this on this mountain, right? These little weird tornadoes that would have spun up mm-hmm. could have um, produced these sounds that is below human hearing, the level of human hearing, like a full octave below, but can supposedly produce these weird behaviors that make people freak out. That would explain and, everything. It would. Except but, the tongue. Right. And I guess the injuries. Sure. Ugh, so I frustrating. Know. I know. I've seen other ones too, like um, there was a guy, and we, we need to mention him a little more. Um, his name was... Uh, Semyon uh, Zolotarov, Zolotaryov. <laughs> Man, this has been tough. His name was Semyon Zolotaryov. He was 38. He wasn't a member of the group. He was a he was an add-on toward the end who was out there with another group that he couldn't get coordinated. So oh. he ended so he up the saying, card. like, hey, can I come with you guys? And at first, apparently the group was not all that happy about him being there. But from what I understand... He really kind of earned his place in there. Um, for a while, people were like, who was this guy? This is a mystery dude. Maybe the KGB was involved. Maybe yeah. he was KGB. He was definitely ex-military. Um, but they And they actually exhumed him to find out if the person who was buried in his grave as him was him. And they did a, a they did like a skull. They took a picture of his skull and superimposed it under a known picture of him. Supposedly it was a perfect match. Yeah. But then they took the extra step of um, comparing the DNA of the corpse in the grave with the DNA of a known relative. Yeah. And it does not match. Oh, okay. I saw that. I didn't know that's who that. I didn't know he was a non. Uh, he wasn't an original member of the group. Yeah, he wasn't in the in the club. So the so some people are like, "There's the KGB was in on this, yeah, or he had hanky. something weird to do with it." It was a little weird for sure. Hmm. And he was one of the ones who suffered um, internal broken or broken ribs, obviously internal. And he also became the editor in chief of their daily paper. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's very strange. He's like, if if it bleeds, it leads. Print it. <laughs> uh, you got anything else? 
Oh man, we could do this for hours, but no. And if you have a, if you're obsessed with the Diet Love incident, mm-hmm. um, we want to know what we got right and what we got wrong. Anything you want to specify, we're happy to hear. Yeah, and I think um, we just officially became the 300th podcast to cover this topic. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> Hopefully we did it some justice. Uh, if you want to know more about the Diet Love Pass incident, you can type those words into, uh, well, the Internet, and it'll give you all sorts of crazy stuff. And since I said that, it's time for Listener Mail. All right, so this one is a bit long, but this is a Josh request. Oh, this one's good. It's a mystery. It is a mystery. And this is from Corey in Joyzy City. Uh, hey, guys, at the open of your recent episode on tsunamis, you both expressed disbelief that the topic had never been covered. In fact, you guys both said you could have sworn you'd already covered it, and you each went back multiple times to check. Even after checking three times, you both admitted to being, quote, paranoid, end quote, that it had somehow been done before. And just like you guys, I was surprised to find out it had never been covered and began to wonder why I had fuzzy memories. Mm -hmm. So I did a little digging, re-listening to old episodes on similar topics. It turns out the three of us are not the only ones convinced of this existent uh, episode, the existence of this episode. Apparently, the 2014 episode of uh, Stuff You Should Know, Josh and Chuck also believed in the existence. In the Rogue Waves episode, right? Correct. Uh, Yes, in the September uh, 2014 episode, show about rogue waves at about 28 minutes in chuck says and i'll do this as chuck okay one of the last things we should cover josh is the difference between rogue waves and tsunamis but we've already done an episode on tsunamis and that josh was gr- that was a great chuck <laughs> I appreciate that i've been working on it <laughs> uh and at this point josh chimes in to confirm the existence you want to confirm it as josh uh, my name is Josh, and I'm confirming the existence of that episode, <laughs> I think is what I said roughly. I think so. And you guys go on to cover the topic quickly, seemingly in agreement that uh, an in-depth explanation isn't necessary since it already existed. Man. This opens the door to many questions, guys. Did any listeners write in after Rogue Waves to ask where the tsunami episode was? Uh, Corey, I don't remember. I don't either. Surely with so many listeners who take pride in having listened to every episode of the show, someone should have noticed. I agree. Uh, why were you guys so convinced of the existence of the tsunami episode in 2014? I don't know, Corey. Wouldn't Jerry notice? Well, no. That's a no. <laughs> uh, is it possible that the lost episode on tsunamis was the tipping point for a sequence of events leading to a doomsday scenario <laughs> and humans from the future were forced to travel back in time in order to try and expunge it from the historical record? It's possible, Corey. That's where my money is. Yeah. But why? What did we say in there that was so ghastly that it could have brought about the end of humanity? Don't know. There's no way to find out either because it's been expunged by the future people. So again, Corey from Jersey City, one of my favorite places. Thanks, Corey. (laughs) Our our buddy John lives there. Oh, no, he lives in Hoboken. Or is it Jersey City? Who? Shout out to John Pendell, either way. Oh, John. Hey, John. He looks at Manhattan out of his window. I know that. That could be anywhere. Well, that's true. Um, but yeah, you might be thinking of Brooklyn. <laughs> no. Uh, thanks a lot, Corey. That was a fantastic email. So much so, I just kept pressuring Chuck to read it. And he did. And I think it worked out well, as we can all agree, right? Yes. Thank you for reading it, Chuck. Certainly. Um, if you want to get in touch with us, you can go to stuffyoushouldknow.com and find us on all of our social medias there. And then you could also send us an email to stuffpodcast at howstuffworks.com. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit howstuffworks.com.